Hello and welcome. Today I'm going to talk about the four um, basic things that you need in order to do audio testing on vintage um, amps like I do. Um, you need four things. For one thing you need, you need load resistors and um, these are 100 watt resistors. They're of course they're in an enclosure. Now I didn't have to put it in this enclosure. I was just getting fancy. Um, they sell these like you can get them like 50 watts, 100 watts. Um, I prefer going with 100 watts because uh, the more you work on something, you will run into cases where it's going to be over 50, your amp or your receiver is going to be putting out over uh, 50 watts. Now I've, I've just had that a couple times since mostly I do like low power stuff. But, you know, if you look at the price difference between a 50-watt resistor and a 100-watt resistor, then you may as well go for the 100-watt resistor. Now, I got these from uh, from China, and these are 8 ohms, 100 watts. About every amplifier that you're ever going to run across has got an 8-ohm output. That's basically the standard. So, I would get I would get something like that. Now, sometimes they do sell them like an off Um like off ohms it's not 8 ohms and it's 8.2 or 3.9 the best thing to do is to get it exactly uh, on the money if you can now these things of course if you're doing stereo work you're going to need two of these and if I had wanted to I could have just used two of them just mounted it again on a little a piece of ply board or even like something like this this is the top for this enclosure just mounted them on there Hell, I could have even taken a frying pan or something, turned that over and mounted them on, on that. That's, um, I don't think it's really, that's really that basically important. You're, you're supposed to use uh, low inductive, uh, basically load resistors, if you can get them. Now, I think I did a test before, and uh, I don't think it really makes that much of a difference unless you're a real stickler. What you should um, what you should really look out for is the, you know don't get it like 8.2 or 8.3 ohms because that's going to make a difference if you're uh, measuring say a hundred watt amplifier. So we do need some kind of visual indicator. Some people like using these digital voltmeters. Um, now I do use this thing a lot. Like if I'm trying to troubleshoot something and I'm taking voltage readings because it's real easy to set up and accurate but say if I was um, doing an now recently I did an AM alignment then I'd want to use something like this with the needles just that much easier for me or you can do like a simple frequency response test with this thing is for me it's personally it's easier to watch the the, the needle um, but you can't use, like, this is an analog meter here. You can't use any kind. You can't use, like, those real uh, El Cheapo two buck one, two dollar ones. Um, because they're going to low down the, the circuit too much that you're um, testing. And also, because of their AC frequency response, the frequency response might be uh, really low and uneven. Now, for example, this one here. I think the frequency response is from uh, 25 to 25 hertz to 1 megahertz, and um, the let's say the AC volt range is down to um, 0 0.3 volts. It's uh, that's the lowest range I can go to 300 millivolts. But the unit back here, for example, that's the um, Heath kit. Now that's goes all the way down to. 0 0.01 volts, I mean, that's 10, um, 10 millivolts um, full scale. So you could, for example, I could measure like the output from a, uh, a cartridge or something like that from a record player. Um, again, that would have an advantage, this one there would have an advantage over this one because this one only goes down to 0.3 let's say uh, 300 millivolts or say if you were doing like a noise if you want to do like a signal to noise check uh, that would this would be 
the heat kit would be more uh, accurate. Um, like not, not too long ago, I was uh, I was doing uh, testing with the I was testing a higher frequency, and like my the AC voltmeter I was using that was accurate, but my here my uh, fluke here was totally totally off. And then I, I then I, I uh, the measurement the voltage measurement. And then I remembered okay, it took me a while to before I realized okay this thing doesn't have the frequency range as for example the heat kit does. Well, that's what the problem was. It was just a stupid error on my stupid error on my part. Now these here this uh, this is FET VOM, and the other one is just an AC voltmeter here there the heat kit. Now that both of these have an input impedance of 10 mega ohms, so they won't load, they won't load your circuits down. Now you notice that here that the heat kit that's also calibrated in decibels. Say if you want to compare the gain or something, you know, okay, one channel I've got this much gain, and the other channel I've got that much gain, and you can just do a direct reading. Um, then you know what the, then you know what the difference is. Now another important thing is that the output has got to be flat basically over as you vary it over a wide frequency range. You can't have any dips or big drops or something like that. Um, it's got to be basically constant over the uh, over the you know the frequency range, especially over 20 from 20 to 20,000 hertz. What you can do is actually, um, you can actually, of course, um, put a voltmeter across here, and then um, as you vary the dial, go to all the frequencies, you can see if the your, your voltmeter fit stays the same. You know that way you can monitor basically. So this is what I mean when I talk about your the output from the audio generator having to remain flat as you vary the generator through a different through uh, a different range of frequencies. Now I'm going to start here at 200. I'm on the times 10 frequency range from 200. I'm going up to 200 to 2,000 hertz. And this needle here now it shouldn't like dip or anything like that and go down or or go up in any way. It should basically stay the same and. Um, it should be like this for all of the all of what this audio generator is rated for so I'm just gonna go ahead and try one range now so I'm gonna go ahead and start starting at 200 Hertz I'm up to 300 Hertz and I'm, I'm going through it pretty fast I don't even know if, it, if I'd go really slow you probably wouldn't even notice probably wouldn't even notice the difference so now I'm almost up to uh, 1,000 hertz, and now I've already reached 2,000 hertz, and you can see the needle basically has remained steady. That's actually what you're basically what you're looking for. Now here's the fourth piece of equipment we need: the oscilloscope. And here I think it's best to get like a dual trace instrument so you can actually. Um, monitor both channels at the same time if it's a stereo unit or you can monitor the input and the output now this goes up to a hundred megahertz here I mean it just depends upon what exactly you want to do with it right just say if you were just doing amplifiers and pre-amplifiers or something you could probably get away with a scope for just which only goes up to a couple megahertz but if you're getting like into CD players or you might be doing work on tuners or stuff like that, or, or TVs even. Um, then, then, of course, you're going to be needing something higher. Now, I don't even use most of these functions here. This is a Tech 2235. Um, I think there's a, there was a previous model. I think it used to be called Tech 465. I used that before. That's an even older model. That that would completely suffice and. That should be, a person should be able to get that cheaply nowadays.